Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. So, well, Martin already sold me, I guess. Uh, so, bonjour. Um, my name is Alexis. Uh, you can guess from my accent that I'm French. I'm CTO at Numberly. I've been around open source for quite a while now. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a maintainer of MKDocs, in case some of you know about it. And I know, I've heard that Tom Christie is a is a, a participant of EuroPython. Um, and this is, yes, my 10th uh, EuroPython participation. Uh, so I'm also a tech speaker and, uh, and, and writer. You can find everything on my, on my website. And I go around the internet as a ultra bug. And today, I'm, I'm the guy standing uh, between you and food. Um, and I'm here to talk about a language uh, that this conference is not about. Um, so I guess most of you are wondering what uh, they are doing here. So I I'm going to try to make that uh, clear right now. People taking interest in Rust uh, today usually already know one programming language. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Uh, we all come uh, with our uh, programming experience and bias. I have, for myself, not uh, studied computer science. I'm a self-taught programmer and a mediocre one. Um, I don't have a deep understanding of the lower uh, representation of the types I work with every day using Python in my code. And uh, I even hated programming uh, before I discovered Python 20 years ago. Makes me old. So, this talk is not a Rust versus Python talk, if you are in for the fight, sorry. Um, this is not a, a comparison as well between Python and Rust. I won't go into lower details between, between the two. I'm not fit for it. And I'm not trying to convince anyone to use Rust instead of Python. So if you find, want to find a good excuse to, to switch and don't do Python anymore, you're not at the wrong place I, either. Instead, I want to share my experience and rationale in uh, adopting Rust as another tool and another programming language that I can use. I want to share my experience in getting Rust in production uh, at Numberly. And I want to maybe emphasize on some thoughts and, and, and perspectives that I got along the way. Now, I need to explain some business context and how Python is used at Numberly and how I got to, to Rust in the first place. So here we go. At Numberly, we process a lot of data. Uh, we are a data marketing company helping clients connect with their own customers using all digital channels available. And for this, we need to crunch uh, a lot of data. A typical pipeline looks like this. Uh, we have uh, three, uh, let's say, uh, Python applications that we will call Python data processors that will get some data out, uh, some Kafka topics. So some raw data that is coming is read by three different uh, Python applications that will then have to enrich this data, meaning that I'm taking some raw data, I'm going to issue some query to a remote database, so a NoSQL one that is SILADB in our case, and then I get some new data in, I add it to the raw data, and I put the result back into a dedicated topic in Kafka. Those dedicated topics will be in turn uh, consumed uh, uh, by downstream applications. So in this case, you can see that I have three uh, front-end Python uh, applications doing this enrichment. And then the enriched data will be fed to uh, partners, business logic, and even clients. Those downstream, downstream applications can be written in Python, Go, Java, whatever. It doesn't matter really. And all of this is scheduled and deployed using Kubernetes at Numberly. Now, this pipeline reliability is really latency sensitive, and we need strong resilience, because if one of those three main processor uh, Python application starts throttling or is slow or fails, our business and partners are at our risk. In the worst case scenario, we lose money or our partners do. And we get angry clients, and nobody wants uh, angry clients, right? So we need to trust those Python applications 
with our lives. At some point, uh, we had and we were faced with the challenge to actually rewrite the business logic around those uh, three uh, Python applications so that we could make them into one. Uh, so this redesign thinking had to happen and um, it got me thinking quite hard, uh, maybe a, a little too bold, uh, because I wanted to approach um, this uh, challenge differently. The go-to decision would uh, just have to merge, have been to merge those three Python applications into one big, one bigger uh, Python application, right? But I was following Rust uh, and Rust maturation for a while, and at that time, it started to, to, to I started to have the feeling that uh, the language as well as its ecosystem were mature enough for a spin. Plus. Their marketing uh, motto speaks to the marketer inside of me, empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. Everyone, well, I felt included, so maybe it could be me. Um, and then, as you heard before, I needed those reliable and efficient software patterns for my use case. So after a not so long thinking, I went to my colleagues I was working on with uh, on those three applications and Python application and said something like, hey, why not rewrite those three Python processor apps into one Rust application? They looked at me like this. I don't blame them, uh, even the even if uh, for a while I almost lost my CTO badge uh, because of this. But uh, they, they were, I don't blame them because those three Python applications, uh, they were up and running for almost five years or something. They were battle trusted. We actually did trust them with our own lives. So we knew them by heart. They were very, very, very good. So instead of having a blunt uh, sentence like this, I, I, I figured out that I, I needed to explain my motivation and the rationale that uh, got, me, uh, got me there and got me to engage with Rust instead of Python for this use case. So Python is usually uh, the first language you learn even at school today, uh, and this is amazing uh, to me at, at least. And uh, it's, it's, prob it's probably due to its popularity uh, and accessibility and wide range of use cases. So you can use Python for almost everything. And I always have been amazed by um, these batteries included philosophy and that you feel very, very fast when you start using Python. And it advertised itself as a general purpose programming language. Python does fit uh, indeed a lot of use cases uh, at Numberly in a wide range of use cases. I, it did fit my processor pipeline use case very well and for a long time. Um, and coped uh, with this growth without a glitch. Over the five years, it almost like uh, tripled in, 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 at, in scale without a glitch. So I want to emphasize something very important right now. Python was fast enough to handle uh, those pipelines at scale. That means that I did not choose Rust to be faster. And I, I agree with, with Brett Cannon. I don't know if you, you know this, uh, this blog post of his, uh, and a lot of us are, are talking about him today, I, I, I see, and that's great. And I agree with him when he says that selecting a programming language can be a form of premature uh, optimization. And so I want to out this. I did not go for Rust to, to, for, to be faster. And I know a lot of people uh, take interest uh, in Rust because it's supposed to be, oh my God, fast, uh, out of the box. But um, coming from Python, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be a mistake. Um, and at least I don't find it to be the, the right angle to approach Rust. Because Rust advertises itself as being efficient, not fast, which, uh, which, is, which is not the same to me because the fast meanings vary uh, depending on your objective, context, and experience. Let's look at it. Is it fast to develop in Rust? No way it can be faster to develop in Rust than in Python. I've been doing Python for 15, 15 years, so I'm, I won't jump uh, into the Rust ship to develop faster. 
Is it fast to prototype using Python? Of course not. The code must be complete uh, to, to run and, and correct as well to, to run. So you just can't uh, Python it or, or just uh, run a simple command and, and see what happens. That's not, that does not exist. Is it fast to process data? Well, Karim just before me uh, said that yes. So of course, maybe, prove it. Uh, that's, a, that's a fair assumption. Uh, but at least I know that Python was fast enough on, in my case. Is it fast to cover all uh, failure cases? Yeah, uh, this is built in, uh, in the language syntax. That is a really interesting feature. Is it fast to maintain? Uh, well, in our case, nobody else at uh, Numberly were doing Rust anyway, so I would be the only one maintaining this, and I'm not that fast, so I'm not sure. Uh, type checking helps and, and typing helps, but I'm, uh, in our case, no. So in summary, going for us will mean that I will be slower. So why would I want to lose time? In one word, innovation. Because innovation cannot exist if you don't accept to lose time. The question is to know when and on what project. Rust makes promises uh, and advertises something else uh, than efficiency, reliability. So I thought that what makes me slow can make me stronger. Why would it make me stronger? Because Rust has some low-level paradigms, such as ownership, borrowing, and uh, lifetimes. At least if it compiles, it's supposed to be safe. It has strong type safety. It makes the, the code predictable, maybe more readable in some cases, and maybe more read maintainable in the long run. The compiler and the Rust compiler is an actual friend of yours when interacting with Rust and trying to figure out what you are doing wrong. It's still better than random Python exceptions. The dependency management in the cargo tunnel is just a joy. Uh, the first time I, I encountered it, I, I couldn't believe my eyes versus the requirements TXT, txt sorry, in French, in English. Uh, mess. Um, I know the Pi Project Tomel initiative goes the right way, and I'm happy about it for Python. It has some exhaustive pattern matching. This one is a, a, a lifesaver uh, because it brings you confidence that you will not be forgetting a special, uh, uh, special case. And it has some error management primitives with the resultinums, which allows you right in the syntax of your code to properly handle failure, and, and that's, that's uh, pretty interesting as well. At least that's some nice promises that uh, you, can, you can try to, to, to take for a spin. So I chose Rust because it provided me with the paradigm and uh, the abstraction level that I needed to understand and better explain the reliability and performance of my application. In other words, I felt like this project uh, was the right opportunity for me to innovate on the reliability and efficiency marks. Now, I expected Rust to be, to be difficult, and uh, it, it really was, uh, but not for the reasons that I anticipated. Let's look at uh, how I learned uh, Rust the hard way. I told you production is not a hello world. Uh, um, I am aiming for a real world application and to, to replace some real world and criti business critical Python applications, right? So adopting a new language straight for production is quite hard, even more with the stake, high stakes that we are talking about, which you have also to monitor and prove with observability, because you can't just take cross promises for granted. You have to, to measure them and prove them that they are right. So here is the stack that my new Rust program had to interact with. Obviously, I needed to be able to connect to uh, Confluent Kafka, get some data out, deserialize it somehow. Then I will need to be able to issue queries to remote NoSQL database to get new data out of the raw data that I got to get enriched data. When I got this enriched data, I need to put it back in Kafka. 
I need to be able to monitor for some failures in, in, in my code and report them. So for this, we use Sentry at Numberly. And then I need to prove everything that I've been, I've been saying so far with proper numbers and graphs. So I need to have Prometheus and then Grafana plug to it. And all of this runs on, on Kubernetes. So let's start with the first wall that I hit in my Rust journey. And it started pretty fast because <laughs> it was uh, due to, to reading data from Kafka. Uh, at Numberly, we use uh, Confluent Kafka uh, with a schema registry uh, feature so that we can enforce strong schemas on the data that we put on the Kafka topics that we, do, that we rely on. And the Confluent Kafka schema registry had some magic bytes at the, at the start of the payload uh, uh, when, you, when you put it in, in Kafka. And this breaks the, the vanilla Apache Avro deserialization. So I had to issue a manual approach. I'm showing the code here. I'm not expecting you to, 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 to read the entirety of it, but um, this is how it's done for later reference if, if you want, and that's the most performant way. Then I, I found out that uh, Yerhard Klich had a, a crate, which is the Rust word for a li library, uh, that is called a schema registry converter. Uh, we worked together on making sure that uh, using his crate uh, didn't hit performance uh, on, on, on reading and the, the Kafka payload. So now it's available, and if you ever have to do it, use his crate. That's, it, it's great. So thank you, Erhard. So I was able to read data from Kafka. Now I need to deserialize it using Avro, and then again, um, it, it was broken. I couldn't deserialize the data that I was now able to read. And uh, at this time, uh, there was no appointed maintainer in the Apache Avro organization, uh, at least for Rust. I, you are new in, the, in, the, in this programming language, right? So I blamed myself for days before I even thought about opening the Apache Avro Rust source code and, having, and have a look at it. But I finally did, and to my own surprise, it was actually broken. So for our complex schemas, the, 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 the official Apache Avro Rust library was not working, and it was broken. I opened it some, uh, some Jira uh, for this, and I actually contributed the fixes uh, to, to the library, which got merged a few months later by the newly appointed maintainer, Martin. So thank you, Martin. I must admit that I felt like uh, being the only person on earth using uh, Avro Rust in production, uh, which was a, a weird feeling in, in, that, in that path. But once it's working, though, it's working amazing. And, uh, and the first uh, gratification I got from it is uh, to actually see the effects of uh, the Rust compiler optimization. So when you use just wrangle with the, with the code, you run in debug mode so that it's faster to build and, and to iterate. And then when you start getting serious, you, you just build your code using the release mode. Uh, they should have called it serious mode. And then it had some uh, nice, uh, nice uh, optimization. And this kind of optimization got my P50 uh, uh, latency down from something like 600 microseconds to to deserialize uh, one message down to almost uh, 70 milliseconds, uh, microseconds, sorry, microseconds. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. It allowed me as well to prove that Avro deserialization is actually faster than deserializing JSON, at least in our complex schema use cases, which was um, something that was expected by a colleague on, uh, of mine and that I could finally prove here. Now, uh, Experimenting requires tangible evidence of, uh, of the impacts of what you're doing, and that's why I always, always, always set up and use Prometheus to meter everything right from the start of my iteration, iterating on an application. And a great learning that I wanted to share here is to fine tune your histograms, uh, buckets, uh, because the default ones are usually not what you are wanting. So you have to know what you want to measure and, uh, and to have an expectation on the latency range of what you are measuring. 
In my case, I expect a, a CLADB insert, so in a remote database, uh, I expect this, uh, this latency to vary from five microseconds to up to 15 seconds, which is the maximal time I would set on, on the server. This is how it's done. In, uh, in, in, in Rust as well, it's, uh, once again, it's, uh, it's, um, it's here for, for reference, but you basically start a timer, issue your query. In the case that this query went OK, you can observe the duration, meaning uh, you can store this, the result and the latency for Prometheus to scrap later. If, you, if it does, did not work, I don't want to pollute my matrix, so I just drop the timer and, and, don't, and don't register it. So this was great. Now, once, once you have the metrics, you need to observe uh, your code with, with Grafana. That's what we use at, at, at Numberly. And this is true as well for Python. Uh, it's not particularly related to Rust in this case. Graph all the things, uh, really, but do it right. Uh, make sure you graph query, throughput, uh, rates, uh, uh, the occurrences of some things, and Know the difference between an occurrence and graphing an occurrence and, and, and a rate. Uh, make sure that you, 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 you also have a strong details about your, your errors, Kubernetes, primary, whatnot. One thing interesting is that the Grafana folks uh, wrote a blog about graphing properly histograms, which is not as straightforward as it looks. So I've put a, a, a link uh, uh, to this because um, this is something that, uh, that can have uh, uh, good impacts on, on, the, on the data and, and insights that you get from, from what you are graphing. So this is how it's done. Now, another interesting thing that, uh, that, I, that I had the, the chance to work on is, uh, well, since I had to issue queries for, to a remote database for every message I got from Kafka, uh, I needed to find a way to absorb tail latencies that come from the database uh, lookups uh, so that it does not ruin my, perform my overall performance of the pipeline. Uh, because sometimes you just have a query that can take, you don't know why, more time that, uh, that, uh, than, than usual. And you don't want your reading from this raw data stream of Kafka impacted too much by this NoSQL query, right? That's what we call tail latencies, because uh, they happen to stack up uh, a, a bit. And I had great fun discovering and playing with Tokyo RS, uh, which is the leading uh, asynchronous runtime in, in Rust. You can compare it to AsyncIO, uh, but this one you have to install it. Uh, so it's not built-in, it's not batteries included. And for this, I, I tried to play, and I played with um, Using and controlling my green thread parallelism, I was able to cope with those latency spikes uh, properly. So the main learning is keep your CPU-bound operations in the main loop. In my case, I get from a, in, on the main loop, I get a message from Kafka. I could decide to either, sorry, um, deserialize it right here, right now in the main loop, or that was my first approach defer this deserialization and then the NoSQL lookup database, uh, database lookup into a green thread, right? But actually deferring a CPU bound operation to a green thread has pretty bad uh, performance uh, uh, implications. So use green threads when IO is required and wait as much as you can to defer these IO bound operations to those green threads and then allow some parallelism and control it uh, within, within, your, within your code. A good demonstration with graphs, since I have numbers. Here you can see that some, some, at some point in time, the CLADB uh, servers uh, had uh, some latency spikes. Uh, the select and insert statements uh, latency went up by a factor of 16, which is, uh, which, which is not so, something that, uh, that you want. This is the graph of, the, of my green thread parallelism, which I also graph, uh, as, you, as, you, as you understand. So what it means is that since my queries were slower to the remote database, I was starting to have more green threads 
stacking up and waiting at the same time. Some of them were still very, very fast, but some of them, because of tail latency, were slowing down. By using this green thread parallelism, I was able to hit only my processing capacity, so the throughput of, my capacity of, of uh, the whole reading of Kafka and outputting to Kafka by a factor of two. So instead of having my application impacted by a factor of 16, using uh, the, this, this technique allowed me to only be hit by a factor of two, which is pretty great. Rust made this exploratory uh, work very efficient and actually pleasant, even if I still was learning the language. And this is the kind of understanding uh, that was harder for me to pinpoint uh, using Python before. For the number of angry of you, uh, these, are, these are some key figures. So what's the max throughput of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, application in our production pipeline? It's around 200K messages per second on, on, on 20 partitions, which with, if I relate to other numbers, let's say that you have 80 million messages waiting for you to be processed. You are able to process them in less than seven minutes. It's pretty cool. What's the late P50 latency of, of uh, the Avro deserialization? We already saw uh, around, around 100 microseconds or less. Inserting data or getting data out the NoSQL CLADB uh, database is also less than a millisecond uh, on P50. Uh, so that, uh, that's uh, pretty, pretty good as well because that they are really big, uh, big tables, like more than two billion uh, rows in the tables and you're just looking for one of them. So it's pretty strong. Now, did I feel look did I feel like losing time uh, using Rust with all these experiments? Hell no. Um, this, whole, this whole experience actually changed me more uh, than I anticipated, and the production uh, uh, results were re rewarding as well. Now, let, allow me to share some thoughts and perspective about this journey. So while Rust is usually not an entrance uh, programming language. I feel like, uh, and maybe you feel too, that it's less intimidating than C or C++. I wouldn't have taken the, the, the chance on, on C or C++ myself. And that's thanks uh, to in syntax, which is quite easy uh, actually to understand coming from Python um, because of this great level of, of, of abstraction, okay? Um, it makes you feel like a programming language that you, would, you could adopt, at least. Python plays very well with Rust, and Arthur showed us uh, earlier this morning how. Uh, so thank you, Arthur, for this. And that way you can benefit from both worlds, uh, as advertised by Brett Cannon and, and Karim before me. Beware, though, uh, Rust being appealing to Pythonistas does not mean that it is an accessible language. Uh, easy to adopt does not mean accessible. You should expect your Rust journey to be difficult. As a general purpose uh, programming language, uh, Python was thought to be accessible and easy to use, and I guess and I hope that you all agree that it is, and losing all those batteries included is really, really hard at first. You feel like struggling for even basic things the best example that comes to my mind is base64, right? You, you need to base64 some string, and you just have to install a separate lib in Rust, whereas you didn't think about it uh, in, in Python, right? Now, Rust's reputation of a systems uh, programming language is not so wrong uh, when it comes to understanding the, the, the internals of your computer. In that perspective, uh, Rust sets higher expectations on you as a developer and on your design decisions, I have experimented and, and showed you before. But that means that you also get the chance to, to, to understand the benefits and the drawbacks of certain implementations. And I learned a lot uh, doing that, and I'm grateful that, uh, that I could. Now, the Rust bureaucracy forces you to learn and, and care about those lower details. Uh, it can be devastating. I, I had some bad, 
bad hours. Uh, feeling feeling bad about myself, yeah. But uh, yeah, you learn a lot and benefit in uh, from the optimizations uh, that comes it uh, that comes with it afterwards. So it's the long term. Uh, it's a long term investment. If you're in for the short term, maybe maybe not, or you are just better than me, so, which is a high probability as well. The best example that I have in, in this is. Um, uh, Handling integers, right? In, in Python, you just set a variable, you set it to an integer like two, and then later in your code, uh, this two can transform into uh, 115 billions, and you don't have to, and you don't care, right? This won't happen in Rust. You have to know in the first place that this integer can grow so big. If you don't, bad things will happen in the best case scenario, uh, the compiler will just tell you. So you have to account for this. The, the, the Python interpreter promoting this integer for you uh, does not exist. You will inherently then be slower uh, coding Python than, than uh, Rust. Uh, slower plus harder means that there's a bargain in using Rust uh, coming from Python, I think. And this bargain can actually be beneficial uh, if you have a clear picture of what you're looking for. Paradigms such as ownership, borrowing, lifetimes, and the result option syntax, they are mind-blowing. Once you start uh, taking interest in them and start understanding with uh, them, after struggling with them, you, you start getting it and, and but just try to picture it. I mean, uh, being able right in the syntax to, to, to express whether something went okay or failed, uh, or if that uh, variable is uh, either something or nothing, right from the syntax, no try except anymore, right? It's, it's really changed my, the percep my perception of the, the code that I write. So Rust is strict so that you can go to sleep uh, without the fear that uh, some random thing that you failed to cover or just, uh, just forgot about uh, will break loose in the middle of the night and that uh, your on-call guy will just phone you uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning. That's better than those random Python exceptions and that I hope you didn't live through. I had. Um, so I had this strange feeling as I went by writing and struggling in writing this application, because even if it was harder for me uh, than coding Python, and I was really feeling uncertain about myself, I was actually feeling very confident in the software that I was writing. And that's a subtle difference. That's a really strange feeling. So, this safe development uh, mindset and experience uh, brings confidence. Now, I, want, I would like to, I, I won't stress enough to reflect on the fast meanings. Uh, don't board the, sh the rush ship just for speed. Uh, reflect on those old meanings about the word fast. It's not a silver bullet. Listen to Brett Cannon. Python will remain my default go-to language uh, to materialize my ideas and iterate on them. Another example of the Rust bureaucracy that will get in your way, static types. Python type hinting it does not convey the confidence that uh, Rust type checking does. Um, that's actually why it's called hinting, I guess. Good naming, thank you. And, uh, Python is actually strict about types. It's, it's just not strict at ensuring that a variab the variable does not change type along the way in your code. That's not the same. And um, I, I never, I have to confess, sorry, today, uh, that I never got used to type hinting uh, in Python. And uh, doing Rust comforted me into not adopting it, actually, <laughs> um, and not investing much time into it, because I understood that that's, that's because I, it was not what I was looking for when I was, you looking, was using Python. So why bother? Uh, so I'm not saying it's useless. Uh, I'm just saying that's, that's, what, that's not what I'm here in the first place. 
So I, I, I feel better with myself with it. Um, and Rust is super strict about it, and to my surprise, I find it reassuring uh, uh, when I need it for certain applications. So if I feel that my project requires those strict paradigms and bureaucracy and will benefit from it in the long run, then I can consider using Rust. And then, when I can consider it, I apply the Rust bargain that I explained to you uh, with my colleagues to decide. So remember, efficient does not mean fast or all the, does not convey all the meanings of the word fast. Now, the Python community is a living joy and, uh, and a great example of, uh, of diversity, humility, and inclusion. I'm, I'm proud that a general purpose language such as Python turned out to create such an amazing and inclusive community. Uh, that's what EuroPython is actually uh, to me, and that's why Martin said that I've been around for quite a while. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm happy and proud to be part of it. I don't know the Rust community as well as I do Python, uh, but from my experience, I found it less, less used to bring in new people uh, without overwhelming them with low-level details that they don't need at, uh, uh, at the time of their own journey. So I wish the Rust community takes inspiration uh, from the, the Python's one and follow its path. Now, with not some random thoughts, uh, Rust uh, changed me more uh, than I anticipating, uh, that I anticipated. Sorry. Uh, using Rust in production forced me to develop new reflexes uh, that I apply to my daily Python. I still don't use type hinting uh, that, that much. Uh, but I care more about my variable types, lifetime, and, 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 and scope than before. Uh, one thing did not change. I'm still a mediocre programmer uh, in Python and now in Rust, uh, and I'm still fine uh, with it. Um, I don't care if my Rust is not as idiomatic uh, as a real Rustian, uh, because I have the confidence that at least it's safe. Uh, I don't care that I don't master every feature of the language I use. I don't feel like I know and master every feature in Python uh, already anyway. Uh, are you using yourself all the Python features? Well, guess what? You don't have to use every Rust feature either. Rust is not the silver bullet. Um, Python is more, in my opinion, and at least it's, it's intended to. And um, now that I understand for myself where I can uh, benefit from the Rust bureaucracy, I consider using it, else Python is just great. Now, every upstart language takes inspiration uh, from the existing ones. Uh, that was true for, uh, for Python when it was an upstart language, which is not anymore. And it's also true for, for, for Rust. But the other way around is possible too, I hope. Um, in that regard, I wish Python uh, tooling experience were better and took inspiration from Rust. Karim told us before about Cargo. And, uh, I, and I wished some cargo-like uh, tool uh, existed for, uh, for, uh, for Python. We could do some, so I imagine it would be named PyKG, something. So you want to, to create a new project and have a, a predetermined scaffolding uh, with a, and working example of a Python, how it's supposed to be with your requirements, TXT or PyProjectOML, sorry, today, uh, already set up for you. PyKG, new project name, thank you just like in Cargo. You want to have uh, a new library installed on your project. You, in Rust, you do Cargo add the, the, the create name, and I wish we could do uh, the same using the same tool, actually, instead of having to switch to pip. I wish there was a clear and embedded uh, no-brainer uh, reformatting instead of having to install black. So just straight from, from the language tooling. And I wish uh, the, the equivalent of Cargo Clippy, which uh, it's, it's an amazing tool. It just analyzes your code and tells you what you could do better, detect anti-patterns, and just propose you to fix it for you or and explain to you why doing this could be turned uh, or made better by, by, by doing this another way. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing, and I, and I wish something 
uh, uh, similar when we were embed in the default Python tooling. Once again, recent work on PyProject Toml and the Python interpreter hinting uh, are going the right way, and I'm happy uh, about it. So it felt like uh, taking the good uh, in my Rust journey and bring it back to my uh, daily Python made me a better Pythonista. I hope this talk was informative and, and gave you some interesting perspectives. Uh, let's keep in touch. I'll be happy to, to answer your questions and see you around during the conference. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for sharing all your experience with Rust and Python together. We have time for if maybe one or two questions, but not too many because dinner is short. So if you have is one question, could you please go to the microphone and ask the question? Hey, okay. yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, you had the opportunity to kind of burn your old projects and start a new in Rust. I'm wondering if, the, if it's possible to like, start something in Rust and still use your old Python code here and there. You could, technically you can. Uh, <laughs> Karim in the, in, and, and even better, Arthur this morning showed how you can embed Rust code into, uh, and bind uh, Rust code into your Python already pre-existing programs for some specifics maybe that you could have. So yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's doable and quite easy to do, actually. So yeah, the, there is, a, there is a, the most efficient one, I think, is PyO3, which I think is pronounced pyoxide um, for the O3. That's my old chemistry uh, background, maybe. Uh, but yes. OK, thanks. Thanks for the question. The next question, please. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Victor. Uh, the question is, what can you suggest, uh, like, um, for example, migration architecture patterns or anti-patterns uh, for the code migration recreation uh, from Python to Rust? Uh, keeping in mind, for example, that Rust doesn't support object-oriented program programming like classes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Tokyo is not async IO at all, so it's uh, <laughs> it's very different things. What can you suggest for uh, to people whose brain is damaged by Python or other languages? And uh, in addition, I can you suggest to use Pons Build? It's a tool for for doing what you mentioned. Ah. Uh, you also you can format your code and build and install dependencies, it will track dependencies and stuff. Okay. Uh, so, when your brain's damaged, you... <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard one. I think, I think the, the best thing is to have actually the realization on how what is damaged in your brain in the first place. Okay? What is hurting you every day? and try to figure out by looking at the perspectives and the Rust promises, if one of those promises could heal you there. So as I said, at least you know what you are entering and what you are looking for so that you can get a, a clear point of view and a clear focus because that, that will allow you to not get overwhelmed with all the rest of the language, right? And it will also have a second good effect that uh, you will get your, the, a rewarding experience at the end because you, you just know what you were looking for uh, when, when starting this journey. But uh, apart from that, I mean, I don't feel like Python damaged my brain. Uh, I, I, I think that it, uh, I, I hated programming because I was, people tried to, to teach me Java which I actually felt a, a, a survival reflex uh, to, to, to push back, and I think I did well. Uh, I, didn't, I, did have, I didn't have it uh, using Python, so I think Python healed me more than it, it damaged me. But, uh, but, um, but I think, yeah, the, the paradigms of Rust, trying at least to understand them, even if you don't plan to use Rust every day, is really interesting because that 
that's some pivot that uh, that uh, that will help you, I think, uh, see your code and approach code uh, differently. And maybe you can find the right use case for you later. Thank you very much for that question. We have time for one more, please. Uh, hi, thanks. Yeah, so I've been um, programming Rust for about a week. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I find most difficult to get my head around is lifetimes. And just at the end of the talk, you said that thinking about lifetimes has changed the way you think about lifetimes in Python. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, lifetimes is, uh, is uh, I still struggle with it, and even more with the actual lifetime syntax in Rust, which is not mind-blowing, but brain damaging, actually, Victor. Um, <laughs> that being said, um, I, 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 I care about it in the sense that Python is very lax in how you can pass or not a reference to a variable in your code. So sometimes you, you just ask yourself, hey, in my Python function signature, should I just pass this variable along all the way, right, or not? Or should I make it mutable, unmutable somehow? So uh, maybe I will consider using some another uh, data model or internal data model. Rust doesn't have all, all, all this kind of mess, right? Because of the borrowing logic. So you can go through your whole experience, that's at least my experience, of, uh, of your Rust experience, just being fine and understanding the borrowing in Rust. And that's enough. So that you, you, don't, you don't have to care that much about lifetimes. At least it saves you for, to keep this topic for way later, okay? And this understanding made me look at how I, I, I create my functions and I pass variables and data around my program differently in Python, just like the, 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 the signature stuff or using uh, proper data, data structures in Python. Okay, thanks for all the questions. Uh, we should now go towards the lunch break and we'll continue with the program from two. Let's have another round of applause for Alexis. Thank you.